Well, good morning, everyone. It's, it's, it's good to see you here this morning. Uh, we we'll just right off the top want to thank uh, Brett and Dylan for holding on the fort. We've been away tracking across the United States, and thank you for your prayers. It's been a really, really good time away from my family, and we're back and ramping up and getting ready for our new ministry year. But I, one thing that's just come to my mind as I've been, uh, you know, spending some time in the Word, spending some time in way, is that we put our hope in a lot of places that we shouldn't put our hope in. Um, and so the question I'm going to ask you before we even get started here this morning is where is your hope? Where are you putting your hope today? Is it in politics? Are you ramping up with the pol political season that we're in? Is that where your hope is today? Or where is your hope? Is it uh, your hope in Scientists finding a cure for COVID-19, is that where your hope is? Or where's your hope? Is it a, a better job or easier times or something as simple as open restaurants and barbershops? Is that where your hope is? Because God tells us to put our hope in Him, and that's what we're going to do this morning as we get into the Word. Uh, Psalm 33, I was reading this in my devotions yesterday, it says this, Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help. And our shield for our heart is glad in him because we trust in his holy name. Let your steadfast love, O Lord, be upon us even as we hope in you. Even as we hope in you. And so this morning we hope to encourage you to put your hope in the Lord and wait upon the Lord. I'm going to pray and I'm going to you know, hand it off to the worship team and they're going to lead us in some songs and uh, that's really where we're going to focus today. Where are you putting your hope? Father, we, we hope in a lot of things. A lot of things that are failing. A lot of things that are futile. And I pray that we put our full hope in you this morning. Encourage those who are discouraged. Enlighten those who are in darkness. Help the weak, Lord. And may we draw near to you. Here this morning, even though we are distant and using media and live streaming things lord i pray that we would feel close because we are close as a family in you in jesus name amen as a church we've been venturing through the beatitudes together and two weeks ago we looked at what it means to mourn to mourn over sin and last week dylan went over the the humbleness of, of what it means to be meek for christ and uh as we continue through, we must remember that these are the practices of a Christian. These are not a, a one-time thing where we can check off the list where we say, okay, I've mourned my sin once. I've looked back at what Christ has forgiven of me for, and looking forward, uh, life is just going to be fine and dandy. We know that life is not that simple. It's not that easy. And lament and mourning is something that we must practice. It's something that we must work into our daily lives uh, as we follow Christ, because there is still sin in the world. There is still sin in our lives. And uh, in this respect, lament allows us to embrace an endurance that is not passive. Lament helps us to practice active patience. It, it is what it means to, to trust in the Lord, that this is what trust looks like. It looks like talking to God, sharing our complaints, seeking God's help, and then recommitting ourselves to believe in who God is and what he has done, even as the trial continues. Lament is how we endure. It is how we trust. It's how we wait. So we see this example in Psalm 13 from David, who uh, was definitely lamenting. He was going through a time of trial, and the majority of the psalm seems almost hopeless. But then he turns at the end and says, but I will trust in the Lord. In Him will I put my hope. So let us read together Psalm chapter 13 as we learn what it means to lament and uh, find hope and trust in our God. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I take counsel in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all the day? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? Consider and answer me, O Lord my God. Light up my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest my enemies say I have prevailed over him. Lest my foes rejoice because I am shaken. 
but I have trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. Let us sing to the Lord who has dealt bountifully with us in sending his son Christ to show his mercy upon us. Praise the Lord, his mercy is more, stronger than darkness, new every morn, our sins they are many, his mercy is
have our hope in, in you. We can trust and lean upon you because you've proved yourself to us in going to the cross on our behalf and providing us with your righteousness. Would we uh, continually trust in that righteousness daily, that it is not of our own doing, but of yours, and that we would live in light of that, that we would live out the faith that we proclaim. We thank you for this time we have to worship you. In your name, amen. Amen. <clears throat> well, thank you, worship team. Thank you for, for leading us and always being here for us. I want to particularly thank everybody who's a part of putting this together, you know, Herman, and um, in, in the back, you've been really helpful with live streaming, and Jamie, and James back there, and Sarah up here faithfully singing week after week. It, it takes a lot to sing to an empty building, and yet they, they do it with great uh, fervor and love for the Lord. I'm just so grateful for the team that, that God's kind of assembled here, and uh, we're grateful uh, for you all. You know, it seems like every time we, we take one step forward, we have to take two steps back with things going on here in California, but we're going to keep pressing forward and pressing into the Lord. I've got a couple of announcements for you as a church family. First of all, um, obviously we're not here at the church, and so we can't pass around the friendship registry, but I feel very disconnected from you as a pastor. We've been gone for a couple of weeks. I haven't really heard from a lot of you, so I would really ask that if you're watching this live stream or if you're watching this later, um, just send a little note saying, hey, this is how I'm doing. This is how you can pray for me to uh, contact at c3hopeville.org. I'd love to hear from you, to hear how your summer's going, maybe hear how God's teaching you. Hey, God's teaching me this. Just drop us a line and let us know. We feel very disconnected, all of us being uh, scattered all over the place. And, and don't let that happen because we are the body of Christ. Also, God uh, has given us many opportunities to continue worshiping him through giving. And so we've got the Tithely app, and we have um, a P.O. Box 58. You can send checks in, or you can drop them by the church. We're usually here during the week. Um, as an act of worship, uh, God continually uh, is taking care of us as a church body, and we can really be grateful for that. He has met our needs and exceeded that in many different ways, and that's uh, wonderful that God's doing that. We're praying about some ways that we may be able to reach out to the community and reach out in different ways, and, and so uh, we're, we're grateful that you continue to worship the Lord through your faithful giving. Also, our youth, they're meeting in smaller groups here on Wednesday nights. Middle school starts at 6, high school's at 7.30. We feel like in this time of isolation, especially for our students and children, it's really, 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 really important that they have some connection. And, and Dylan's told me that it's been going pretty well. We've had some folks uh, that he hadn't seen for a long time showing up. And so we're really excited about this. Middle school at 6 p.m., high school at 7.30 p.m., and there will be pizza served. So if that's the incentive it takes for you to come, come on down. We'd, we'd love to see you this, this summer, get you out of the heat get around the Word of God and grow together. That will be a, a great time for your students. And, and parents, make sure your kids are here. Uh, there's not an awful lot that they can do um, right now being under this lockdown. And so this is something that can be productive for them. Let's not waste this time for our students. Let's get them to youth group and, and, and get them together learning about the Lord and have some positive influence in their lives. That's all the announcements I really have. Um, we're getting ready to jump into our Bible. So, so turn to Matthew 5, and then we're going to see this little video uh, as we prepare our hearts for the Beatitudes. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God.
you know, we've been going through this mini-series, and I really thank Dylan and, and Brett for kicking this off and getting us going. And we're in Matthew chapter 5, verse 6. I titled today's message, I, I Can't Get No. And for, for many of you, uh, you know what the completion of that is, a very, very, very famous song by the Rolling Stones, I Can't Get No Satisfaction, right? I Can't Get No Satisfaction. That was their number one hit when they came here to the United States many, many years ago. But there's not just one song that speaks about satisfaction. There's a lot of songs, right? There's a lot of advertisements. There's a lot of things that we can find our satisfaction in. Um, things, experiences, people. We're told often to uh, buy this and you'll be satisfied. Or go here and your life will be awesome. Go to this vacation place and your life will be great. Or get in with these people. Get to know these people. And you will be fulfilled. You will have arrived. But if all this is true, why are we so unsatisfied? Why are we personally so unsatisfied? I can tell you that from my own heart. I've struggled a lot with this isolation. And struggled with anger. Uh, struggled with sadness. Struggled with a lot during this isolation, and, and, and I just can't seem to be satisfied with what's going on. I mean, why are we so empty? Why are we so unsatisfied? Jesus is going to turn to that question this morning. Look down at chapter 5, verse 6. We're just going to read the verse here this morning. He says this, Jesus says to us, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied that they shall be satisfied. That's what we're shooting for today. Maybe the reason that we can't find satisfaction is because we're looking in the wrong places. We can't get no satisfaction because we're shooting in the wrong direction. I didn't have a slide for this this week, but maybe jot this down because this is really where we're going here today. Our big idea is this, where you seek your satisfaction from will determine your life's direction. Where you seek your satisfaction from will determine your life's direction. Or in another way, you are what you eat. You are what you long for. That's what Jesus is telling us here in the scripture of I don't know if you're aware of it this week, but one of the, the great heroes of the modern day faith passed away. G.I. Packer passed away at 93 this week. Um, a wonderful man of God. If you've never read a book by G.I. Packer, um, go to Amazon right now and Google the word know, you know, on Amazon, Knowing God and Buy Knowing God. Uh, influential, probably one of the top 10 most influential books in my entire life about knowing God. J.I. Packer was satisfied in the Lord, and he had many, many quotes, but he says this, at, uh, during one of his writings, he said this, the life of true holiness is rooted in the soil of odd adoration. It's when we adore God that our lives are changed. And that's exactly what we're going to look at here this morning. How can we find our satisfaction in Christ so that we will be satisfied in him and him alone? Let's pray, then we're going to jump into this uh, today. Father, um, we confess to you that we don't often hunger and thirst for righteousness. I confess to you, Lord, that in my own life I've been very, very empty because my hunger and thirst has been for things that will never satisfy. So God, I pray this morning as we get into your word that you would spark a hunger in our hearts. You would make us thirsty for your word so that we would come from this place here this morning and be satisfied in you. Lord, help us 
to keep our focus on that here this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, Dylan and Brett have been faithfully walking through these Beatitudes with us. They've kind of broken it down. So just kind of in review, you know, the first word that we see here in chapter 5, verse 6, is that word blessed, that word happy, right? They've both talked to you much about that. I mean, we all want to be happy, right? We want to figure out what's the secret of happiness, that life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness that we all know that we're striving for. But this is a countercultural way of speaking. This sermon is against the way that we would normally go. And so Jesus says this, if you want to be happy, you need to be poor in spirit. If you want to be happy, you need to mourn. If you want to be happy, you got to be meek. And we're left feeling like, huh? That doesn't seem right. And then he throws this in in verse 6. He says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Those words hunger and thirst would be very, very familiar to people of ancient times. In ancient times, they didn't have refrigerators or pantries where you just walked over and you opened it and it was full of food. Food was scarce and there were times of of, of famine and times of drought that they would often go through. So this, this aspect of being hungry and thirsty is a real problem for people of ancient times. And it's even a real problem today in the world around us. Uh, not very often here in the United States, but all around the world, there are many places that suffer from hunger and famine. I mean, there's malnutrition and dehydration. We, we suffer from a different type of, of, of a problem of unhealthy eating really affects a lot of us. But Jesus is saying this, um, blessed are the people who hunger and thirst for righteousness. And it's not just a one-time hunger. It's a deep, deep hunger. It's that, what I like to call my family, that hangriness. Have you ever been hangry, hungry, and angry? Been so hungry that you're just like, I gotta eat something. Or I'm gonna bite someone's head off. We, we have that hangriness. We, we had a couple times on our vacation as we're driving. We're like, we need to stop and eat something. We're going to like be very angry with each other. I, I feel like vacation is this. It's just eating in different places, right? It's going from one place to one place. It's like you finish one meal and you're like, hey, what are we going to eat for dinner? It's just, vacation is eating all around. But this is this extreme hunger, this extreme thirst. And he doesn't say, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for a good meal. He doesn't say blessed are those who hunger and thirst for anything that we would think he would normally say. He says this, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Now what does that mean? What is righteousness? Well, it's clearly not your own self-righteousness because he's going to take that on with the Pharisees all throughout the, the gospel it's not about your intellect, it's not about your righteousness, but what does it mean to hunger and thirst for righteousness? Well, let me break this down for you because it's actually found right here in these Beatitudes. The key to understanding this is right here, right before you. We're going to unlock it right in front of you. There are eight Beatitudes, right? Verse 10 and 11 are really the last Beatitude. They're really one together. Verse 3 and verse 10 are kind of like the breads on the sandwich, right? Look how verse 3 ends. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. That's the top piece of bread. Look at the bottom piece of bread in verse 10. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, there's our word, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Do you notice that verse 3 and verse 10 both end in the same way, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So these these truths are about those who are to inherit the kingdom of heaven. So that's how we start in verses 3 and 10. So within that sandwich in verses 3 through 10, there are two groups of four beatitudes. Verses 3 through 6 is the first group, and verses 7 through 12 is the second group. And guess what? They both end talking about righteousness the first group 
verses 3 through 6, talks about righteousness. Verse 10 talks about righteousness. I just think things like that are so cool in the scripture. Maybe I'm a Bible geek, and I, I get that, and I get geeked out when I see these things, but it's, it's, it's really interesting when you think about that. So what's the point? What does this mean? Let me unpack this for you. The first three Beatitudes, the Beatitudes that Brett and Dylan preach on, lead into verse 6. They're all talking about getting rid of or emptying ourselves. Do you see it? Look at verse 3. It says, blessed are the poor in spirit. That's an emptying, emptying of yourself. Blessed are those who mourn, emptying of yourself. Blessed are those who are meek, emptying of yourself. We are to empty ourselves of these things so that we can be, verse 6, filled with righteousness. What gets in the way of us hungering and thirsting for righteousness? It's that we're not emptying ourselves of ourselves. So how do we do that? How do we do that? It's simple, but it's not easy. It's reminding ourselves of the gospel. Christ's righteousness. And the only way we can remind ourselves of that is if we are poor in spirit, is if we are meek, as if we are mourning. The only way we can come to the foot of the cross is if we know that we need the cross each and every day. And folks, that's so hard to remind ourselves of that because we compare ourselves to each other. We're like, well, I'm bad, but I'm not as bad as that person. And Christ says, oh, you're not to compare yourself to that person. You're to compare yourself to me. 2 Corinthians 5.21 tells us that God made Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin. Why? So that we would have the righteousness of God in him. We would have God's righteousness in us. So maybe the reason that you and I are so unsatisfied in our life is because we have forgotten that we are saved by Christ's righteousness, that we need a Savior, and that Savior's name is Jesus Christ. And maybe you don't even know that you're sitting there at home, someone gave you this, this, this website and said, go and listen to this crazy guy out there in, uh, you know, Holtville and listen to this sermon, and you're sitting there going, like, what's he ranting and raving about? And you're like, yeah, 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 I'm really unsatisfied in my life. Maybe you have never really taken yourself to the foot of the cross and realized I'm a sinner, I need a Savior, and that Savior's name is Jesus Christ. Maybe that's where you find yourself here today. Maybe you just need to be reminded of that truth, that Christ alone saves, that Christ's righteousness not only saves us, but sanctifies and grows us as well. There's so much unrest in our world. There's so much anger in our world. There's so much fear. And listen to me, Cornerstone. We cannot buy in to the anger, the unrest, and the fear. Because Jesus is greater than all of that. Maybe the reason that you're sitting at home here today and you're unsatisfied in your marriage, you're unsatisfied in your family, you're unsatisfied with your work situation, you're unsatisfied with the laws of the state of California, maybe the reason that you're unsatisfied in all these ways is because you've forgotten the gospel and you've forgotten what you have been placed here for, which is the hunger and thirst for the righteousness of God so that you would find your satisfaction in him. John Piper has built a whole ministry on desiring God and finding your satisfaction in God and God alone. If you want to read a book on that, Desiring God or, or um, Don't Waste Your Life, great books by Piper that talk about finding our satisfaction in God. And when we are filled with the righteousness of God, verses 7 through 11 are what's going to happen. And so this next half of the Beatitudes series, we're going to talk about what happens when we are filled with the righteousness of God. Let me give you a little preview. 
persecution comes when you're filled with the righteousness of God. It's not a peaceful, easy life, a peaceful, easy feeling. Persecution is promised to those who are filled with the righteousness of God. Jesus takes this on. Chapter 5, verse 20, he says this. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. What was he meaning by this? He was saying, unless you are more righteous than the most religious, self-righteous people on your own, you're not going to enter the kingdom of heaven. He wasn't saying the Pharisees were going to enter the kingdom of heaven because they were self-righteous, because they were the model of righteousness. The whole rest of this sermon is unpacking that untruth, that they were not righteous. But he says, unless you're even more righteous than them, and the thought would be like, how can I be more righteous than the most religious person that I know? And the answer is, you can't. Christ has to do it for you. And so with all this in mind, Jesus attacks that one place, that dissatisfaction that we have in our heart, and said, there's a reason for that. Because you were looking to find something in this world that this world was never designed to give you. St. Augustine, many, many years ago, wrote this. He said, Thou hast made us for thyself, God. And our hearts are restless till we find our rest in thee. Do you get that? That restlessness that God has put in your heart is God-given. Not so that you would go and wander the world and look for that experience, not so that you would work hard at your job to get just enough money in your 401k to watch it all go down the drain in two weeks, you know, because of a downturn in the economy. He put that restlessness in your heart so that you would find your rest, not in this world, but in him. That's super important. So back to the question we started with. If that's the case, why are we so spectacularly unsatisfied? Why do we live such unsatisfied lives? Let me just tell you, before vacation, I was running on fumes, on empty. And I needed to unplug and get away and spend some time with the Lord. And it was a good time. I had many times lying in a hammock, praying and reading and D. Martin Lloyd-Jones, in his commentary on this, I think hits the nail on the head. Why do we find such unsatisfied people in the church, the place where we should find the most satisfied people? D. Martin Lloyd-Jones says this. He says, there are large numbers of people in the Christian church who seek to spend the whole of their life seeking something which they will never find. Got your attention? Seeking some kind of happiness and blessedness. He says they go from meeting to meeting, convention to convention, always hoping that they're going to get this wonderful thing, this experience that's going to fill them with joy and flood them with some ecstasy. They see other people have had it, but they themselves do not seem to get it. Now that's not surprising. Listen to this. We are not meant to hunger and thirst after experiences. We are not meant to hunger and thirst after blessedness. If we want to be truly happy and blessed, we must hunger and thirst after righteousness. We must, we must not put blessedness or happiness in the first place. So why are we so often spectacularly unsatisfied it's because we hunger and we thirst listen to me for the wrong things we hunger and thirst for the wrong things we're we're happy with spiritual junk food and not the life-giving word of god we love spiritual junk food and so as I was thinking about this, as I was driving on the road through New Mexico, 
which there's nothing to see, by the way, if you're driving through New Mexico. It just seems like wide open on 40. Just driving, driving, driving. I was just thinking to you, what, what are some of the barriers? Because there's a, there has to be a reason why so many of us feel unsatisfied in our lives. What are the things that stand in the way for us from hungering and thirsting for God's righteousness? I came up with five. And I probably could have come up with 500 if I really, really thought about it. So these are kind of like categorized around these. Here are five barriers to to having the right hunger and thirsting for righteousness. Or if you want to title it a different way, five substitutes. Five substitutes, things that we often hunger and thirst for rather than God's righteousness. The first one is really easy to figure this one out. It's this, money. You'd be like, oh, yeah, yeah, I get that. I mean, think about it. Jesus speaks more about money than he does heaven and hell in the Gospels. He speaks more directly to the issue of money. In 1 Timothy, Paul warns young Timothy, he says this in 1 Timothy 6.10, for the love of money, listen to this, not money, but the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. He's saying the love of money is the basis for all sorts of evil. It is through craving money that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. Money's a real problem. It grips our hearts. Jesus speaks directly to this in chapter 6. Just flip right over maybe another page. Verse 19, he says this, Don't lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, where thieves do not break in and steal. Listen to this. For where your treasure is, there's your heart also. He just dropped down to verse 24. He expands upon this. No one can serve two masters, for either he will love the one and not love the other. He'll be devoted to one and despise the other. He summarizes his teaching with this. You cannot serve God and money. That's a pretty pointed statement. Because the way that we live today is that we believe in our culture that if you have enough money, it will solve anything, right? More money for education. People will become more enlightened. More money in your 401k will take care of you for the rest of your life. More money, more money, more money. We believe that money will satisfy possessions, the right vacations. It'll bring power to us. And and guess what? It all melts away at one point. And Jesus knows this in our heart. He speaks much to the way that money grips our hearts And I think one of the reasons why we don't hunger and thirst for the righteousness of God is because we spend too much time hungering and thirsting for money. For money. That's one barrier. Huge barrier. In our consumeristic culture, you can see it everywhere. But here's another one. So I'm going to go from preaching to meddling right now. It's this. Politics. You're like, ooh, he went there. Yeah, I went there. We're 100 days away from a presidential election, and everything is political now. Sports, um, advertising, everything is political. And whether you think that uh, President Trump is Satan, or whether you think that President Trump is the savior, which he's neither, by the way, folks. He's neither. Um, Or whether you think that if we just get the right person in power, I'll be satisfied. Let me tell you something. I've been following politics since the early 80s, and politics never satisfies. Never satisfies. Because even if your guy gets in, he will disappoint you. He will disappoint you. Even if we get the right judges on the Supreme Court, they will disappoint you. It just happened recently. You know, politicians lie. Gridlock happens. And the press stirs all up this this anger with politicians and things going on in the culture. Let me tell you something. If you hunger and thirst for politics, you will be greatly unsatisfied. 
because you're looking for the wrong thing to satisfy. Let me remind you of something. No matter who is the president of our country, this is true. Proverbs 21, 1. The king's heart is a stream of water in the hand of the Lord. God is in charge. And he, God, will turn it any way he wills. Folks, don't spend more time watching CNN, Fox News, MSNBC than you do looking into the scripture and hearing from the one who knows it all. Don't hunger and thirst. Don't hunger and thirst for politics. Don't be more invested in politics than you are invested in Jesus. And let me tell you, here's a great litmus test to figure out if that's true in your life. Can you pray for your leaders? Can you pray for the president? Can you pray for our governor? Because this is what we are called to do. 1 Timothy 2 says this, First of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people. Well, what do you mean all people? Well, I'm going to tell you. 1 Timothy. For kings and all who are in high positions. So, wait a second. I'm supposed to pray for the president. I'm supposed to pray for Nat. Nancy Pelosi, I'm supposed to, to pray for Chuck Schumer, I'm supposed to, to pray for Mitch McConnell, I'm supposed to pray for Gavin Newsom. You're like, oh, I don't know that I can do that. Well, let me, let me tell you why you should do that, because he tells us. Why should we pray for all of them? For kings and all who are in high positions, why? Why should we pray for them? that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good, God says. You want to know what's good? Praying for your leaders is good. This is good. And it's pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who desires for all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Let me just give you this little, this, this little freebie right here. Next time you complain about your politicians or the politicians around you, here's the next thing I want you to do. I want you to complain, okay, complain, and then pray. You're like, I'll be praying an awful lot. Good, right? Because I've been doing, I got to be honest, I've been complaining an awful lot about our politicians, in particular here in California. But if you cannot pray for those who are in later leadership, maybe that is a litmus test telling that you are hungering and thirsting more for politics than you are for God's righteousness. Here's a third one. Five barriers to satisfaction, money, politics. Number three, religion. You're like, religion? Yeah. Religion, what do I mean by that? Religion that, in particular, the religion that focuses on the externals. The do this and don't do this type of things. The rules-based things. That, you know, church has to look this way, and I've got to do these things. Jesus takes this head on in chapter 5, verse 21, where he says this, You've heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you, that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council, and whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. What's Jesus doing? For the whole rest of the Sermon on the Mount, he uses this formula. You've heard it said, but I say to you. What is he doing? He's dismantling that man-made religion that was popular at that time. And folks, we have a man-made religion that's popular at this time, that if you vote this way and you tithe this amount of money and you go to this specific type of church, you're good to go. But it is not about rules. It's not about voting patterns. It's about a relationship with Jesus Christ. And let me just say this. You have more in common with the saved friend that votes politically the opposite of you 
than you do even an unsaved family member. As part of the family of God, you have more in common with that person. Religion never, ever saves. It's the relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Here's the fourth one, fourth barrier to right hunger is this comfort or security. Yeah, we've, we've been exposed with this. Because previous to mid-March, I think everybody was like just, just trucking along. Things were going great. Seemed like, oh, 2020 is going to be a great year. And then this virus from, from overseas um, started sprouting up, and we started hearing things about it, and then there were some closures. And I remember the day, it was a Wednesday, where it seemed like the wheels just fell off. And all these major sporting events started canceling. And, it, and I thought, whoa, that's billions of dollars in their pocket. Something must be going on. And a thing called COVID-19 crept into our consciousness. And it's still there every day. As a matter of fact, polling tells us that it's the number one issue in most people's lives right now is COVID-19. Just thinking about it, worrying about it. And what this has done, this, this, this little bitty virus, this microscopic virus has exposed our hunger and our thirst for comfort or security. This false feeling that we have always been in control. And we are not in control, folks. You, just say that with me at home. Just, just confess this with your family. I am not in control. Say it. Say it to your kids. Say it to the people around you. I'm not in control. And keep saying it. Keep saying it. I'm not in control. Because you're not. We live in a dangerous, broken world that is full of injustice, sickness, and death. This is not a safe world. And Jesus knows that. Verses 9 through 11 remind us of this. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Look, if you're going to live for Christ, it won't be safe. It's getting less safe every day. In areas around the world, you will lose your life living for Christ. And folks, it's coming. It's coming here to our shores. Trust me on this. Scripture tells us this is true. But here's the reality. God is in control. God is completely in control. Amen, right? Amen. We, we see it all throughout Scripture. Romans 8, 28. God works all things for good. He works everything for good. Proverbs 19, 21. Many are the plans in the mind of the man, but it is the purpose of the Lord that will stand. Or how about this? Just like over everything. Psalm 115.3, our God is in the heavens. He does all that he pleases. He does everything that he pleases. Look, let me free you of something. You are not in control. You are not God. I mean, you and I, we can't even reach the steering wheel to steer the car of the world around us. We couldn't do anything if we tried to be in control. We, we, we saw that in the book of Job, right? We're not in control. And yet when we hunger and thirst for control and for security, God uses suffering and difficulty to unmask that for us. And he has definitely done that with COVID-19. If your prayers are just about being secure and safe and COVID-free, direct those prayers to the Lord. And just say, God, just, just, just help me to realize I'm not in control. Your will be done. Not my will be done. Your will be done. But that's a barrier to hungering thirst for it. Here's the fifth one. And this will take a little explaining, but it'll be short. It's this. Ignorance. It's a barrier to hungering and thirsting for it. Well, what do you mean by ignorant? Like, nobody wants to be called ignorant. But we are ignorant of a lot of things that we are called to do in the scripture. I, I see this so much when people take scriptures and twist them out of, of context. And they say, well, God's calling us to do this. And I'm just like, 
That's not at all what that scripture says. It's, it's out of ignorance that we often don't, don't go to God for direction. We go to our neighbor. We go to the talk shows. We go to psychology and things like that, but we don't go to God. And so it's out of ignorance that we, we look to money and politics and religion and security. Ignorance feeds all these other things. How do we hunger and thirst for God's righteousness? we got to actually know God. And we got to know him more and more each day. we got to know him through prayer and through meditation and reading and listening to sermons and music and friends. We get to know him through trials. We get to know him as we grow more and more. And that's so, so important. But ignorance really kind of stands away in a lot of these. I want you to take your, your Bible, just go back one chapter, chapter 4. Very, very familiar chapter when I read it to you. But I want you to see someone, the best person I can use as an example, Jesus Christ. Someone who actually hungers and thirsts for righteousness. And what does it look like? Listen, listen to this. Chapter 4, verse 1, Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. So he was fasting for 40 days and 40 nights. And <laughs> I love this. Matthew says this. He was hungry. <laughs> this is kind of like, yeah, yeah, 40 days and 40 nights. Yeah, he was hungry. I, I, if I could change this a little bit, he was hangry. He was definitely angry at that point, right? He was hungry. The tempter came and said to him, if you are the son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that comes from the word, from the mouth of God. So what's Satan go to first? His physical hunger, right? Well, just make these stones become bread. Jesus could have done that any time during the 40 days. He had the power to do that, but he said, no, I don't live by bread alone. So, so then the devil goes to a different hunger, a different thirst. Verse 5, then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple. And he said to him, well, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down for it's written, he will command his angels concerning you. And on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against the stone. And Jesus said to him, again it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Now notice something. Satan quotes scripture out of context to Jesus. And Jesus just says, that's not what that means. Verse 8, again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all of these, I'll give you everything if you will fall down and worship me. He said, I'll give you everything that you want if you just go not the path that God has for you, but my path. And then Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan. For it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. And then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and were ministering to him. What does it look to hunger and thirst for God's righteousness? It's to be so soaked with the scripture that in any and all circumstances, you turn to God. No matter where life is good and life is difficult, no matter if you get to go on vacation or you're sheltered inside because of COVID-19, it's always looking to God, hungering and thirsting, drawing near to him that he will draw near to you. See, where you seek your satisfaction from will determine the direction of your life. And are you sitting at home here today unsatisfied? Are you angry? Are you fearful? Are you stirred up inside? Maybe the reason that all that unsatisfaction is in your heart is that you're looking for satisfaction in the wrong places. You're looking for satisfaction in temporary things. When God is calling you to satisfaction in him and him and alone. Because his satisfaction, the satisfaction that you find in Christ, will satisfy forever. Forever. And you will be satisfied forever. The bread of life, the living water, will satisfy your hunger and your thirst. And that is what Jesus is trying to teach us here this morning. Are you listening? 
Are you listening? Find your satisfaction in the bread of life, in the living water, in him alone. Let's pray. I'm going to invite the worship team to come back up and kind of wrap this up and lead us in a song. God, we have to admit that we look for satisfaction in the things around us because, frankly, it's easier sometimes. And yet we forget that time and time again, money disappoints, politics disappoints, looking to feeling secure and in control disappoints. Looking at the things around us, possessions disappoint. Even people we love disappoint us. God, we're desperate for you. And we're lost without you. And I pray that you would stir in us a hunger and a thirst that can only be found in you. Lord, make us a people that hunger and thirst for your righteousness. Knowing that if we do that, we will be spectacularly satisfied. Thank you, Lord, for the bountiful blessings you shower upon us. May we turn those blessings to praises to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Empty 
good and gracious to us. We are grateful for how he blesses us and takes care of us and is always there for us. And, you know, um, it has been tough. It's been tough not being able to see each other. And we're praying uh, for the day that we can fully open, but we are going to keep pressing on and keep finding ways to connect with each other. Please find ways to connect with each other. Uh, think of those who... Um, you haven't heard from or seen in quite a while and pick up the phone this week and call them you know that thing that we often text on is also used as a phone sometimes we can do that we can call and text each other and, and just connect with each other there's just one one thing that's just been kicking around in my mind and i'm totally going to put brett on the spot with this um can you sing the doxology for us at the end can we sing it i think we can i knew he could do it and I totally threw this out of left field, but as I was just standing over there and thinking through this, um, how we need to keep our focus on the Lord, because so often we, we, uh, we focus on the things around us, and that's why we hunger and thirst for those things. And so Brett's going to lead us with this, this simple doxology. The doxology is focusing on the Lord. It's our benediction, and then we'll uh, have some things afterwards on the live stream. I think there's a kid's video and some other things that are We'll start popping up on there now. But uh, we're going to sing this doxology together. Just listen to these words if you don't know them. Most of us kind of know them from heart. Brett, go ahead and lead us in this. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him of creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Such a fitting way to end our time together, right? Praise God, from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host, above the angels. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. It's been sung for 
many, many years all around the world. It's so just a reminder that when we look for our satisfaction in him, we will be truly satisfied. You are loved, Cornerstone. You're loved by God the Father in so many ways. He loved by us here at Cornerstone. Look forward to seeing you soon. Uh, call, text, email. We'd love to hear from you. See you soon. Jesus' disciples had been hard at work. They had been healing people and teaching them. So many people came and went that the disciples did not even have time to eat. So Jesus said to them, come with me. Let's go to a quiet place where we can be alone and get some rest. Jesus and his disciples got into a boat to cross the Sea of Galilee. But many people saw them leaving. The people traveled by foot and they ran ahead of Jesus. When Jesus and his disciples got to the shore, the people were already there waiting for them. Jesus saw the crowd and he cared about them because they were like sheep who needed a shepherd. So Jesus taught the people many things about God's kingdom and he healed people who were sick. By this time, it was late in the day. Jesus' disciples came to him and said, we are out in the middle of nowhere and it's getting late. Tell the people to go away so they can go to the farms and villages to buy themselves something to eat. But Jesus said, they don't need to go away. You give them something to eat. Jesus' disciples were confused. We can't feed this many people, they said. It would cost a whole year's pay to buy enough bread for them to eat. Philip said, Jesus asked them, how many loaves of bread do you have? Go look. Jesus' disciple Andrew said, a boy here has five loaves and two fish, but what good will that do for so many people? Jesus told the disciples to instruct everyone to sit down. So all the people sat down in big groups on the grass. Jesus took the five loaves of bread and the two fish. He looked up to heaven, and then he blessed the bread. He broke it into pieces and gave it to the disciples. He also divided up the fish. The disciples passed out the food to the people, and everyone ate until they were full. Then Jesus told the disciples to collect any leftover food. The disciples collected 12 baskets full of pieces of bread and fish. Jesus fed about 5,000 men that day, plus women and children. By feeding the 5,000, Jesus provided for the physical needs of the crowd. The next day, Jesus called himself the bread of life. Only Jesus is able to satisfy your souls forever by providing forgiveness, friendship with God, and eternal life.